Uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, I hope you're all well. Thank you very much for joining us. Um, obviously, absolutely delighted to welcome Peter Hall here this evening. Um, I've got a bit of a story which I'll get to in just a second before I pass over to him, but I hope you've all got a bottle of Breaky Bottom. Um, I've got the Jack Pike, which is in the fine wine list at the moment and available online. And we'll be talking about that a little bit later. Um, but yeah, first, before I hand over to Peter, I, I wanted to give kind of my own story, if that's all right, about, about Breaky Bottom, because it's, it's one that's quite close to my heart, I must say. Um, about 11 years ago, when I was still at university, my family and I went on a family holiday to Brighton. Um, I'm, I was brought up in Bath, and so we decided on Brighton because yeah. I was at university, and both my older sisters were either at university or living in London, so it meant that we could all afford to get there. And it meant that when we were all sick enough of each other, we could go home easily. So we went to Brighton and on one of the days we went to Breaky Bottom. And I remember driving in our hire car, I think, and we got to the edge of the drive that takes you to Peter's house. And I think we pulled up, we all got out and looked at it and thought, no way, we can't possibly have to go down here because I'm sure if anyone on this Zoom has, has been to Breaky Bottom, it is, it is a, a pretty serious track that, that takes you there. But we persevered, we went down, and after a few minutes, we saw some vines, and then you see a few more, and then you see a, a, a roof and a shed, and, you know, all of a sudden we were just in this, this different world, which is, which is Breaky Bottom. And we all pulled up, we got out of the car, nobody there, absolute silence, uh, waited a couple of minutes, nobody there uh, and then a rather gorgeous little cat kind of trotted up to us so I think his name was, name was Toto it, it's possible that the, the cat's still around I hope it is because it was absolutely gorgeous and so eventually after the cat kind of got sick of our affections it it wandered off into the vineyard and so we thought well let's let's follow the cat maybe the cat knows where where Peter is and lo and behold there was Peter in and amongst the vines working incredibly hard it was a, a really hot day and he looked at us, slightly confused, and said, do you have a reservation? And we said, yes. And you know, his face just lit up with, with, with joy. And he spent well over an hour showing us the vineyard, the vines, the winery, the store, and then took us into, into his house and did a really detailed, amazing tasting with us. Um, and we all just fell in love with Breaky Bottom. We fell in love with the wines, we fell in love with the place. Uh, and it was probably the first vineyard I, I ever went to. And it was certainly that trip, which was part of me wanting to join the wine trade. And so soon after I finished university, I applied for a job at the Wine Society. I got that job at the Wine Society. And I knew pretty much from day one that my dream at the Wine Society was to be a buyer and to one day buy Peter's wines and sell them at the Wine Society. Now, I don't really believe in fate or destiny or predeterminism or anything like that, but this is genuinely true. The day I was told I'd be taking over England buying for the Wine Society, Freddie, my predecessor, had got a letter sent literally that day. And so he passed it to me and said, well, you know, you better look at this now, seeing as you're the new buyer. I opened it up. And it was a letter from Peter asking incredibly politely whether we at the Wine Society would be interested in taking his wines and selling them. And it was just this mad kind of crescendo of, you know, thoughts and feelings and thought, wow, this is just too surreal. Um, obviously, Brexit, uh, not, not Brexit, it happened ages ago. Um, COVID happened. And so there was a little bit of a delay, but I'm delighted to finally have uh, one of Peter's wines on sale at the Wine Society again. We actually st stocked his still wines back in 1989 and 1990, I believe. But uh, as he'll tell you now, he's he's sparkling only. So that's my personal experience with Breaky Bottom. Um, and uh, I'm going to hand over to Peter now, who's going to who's going to kind of give you his history, hopefully, and give the story of of Breaky Bottom for you all as well. Thanks, everyone. Enjoy your evening. Well, don't abandon me, Matt. I am going to enjoy. Um, thank you for the nice welcome, you and the team. Uh, Toto is still around and he was listening. Mm -hmm. And 
he had his hands on his hips saying, well, of course I'm still around. Yeah. <laughs> He's a great cat. Um, a Bengal cat. Uh, and you're right. Just to capitalize, to, to, fill, to fill the uh, your description of Breaky Bottom, it's five miles from Lewis. Um, and you, you can... You can get to it if you go to a farm called Northeast Farm. And then you just drive through the farm and you drive for about a mile and a half down a long and bumpy track. And when I first um, started working there, after I'd had a, an agricultural degree from Newcastle, why are you man? I'm a Geordie. Mm -hmm. uh, and I love the Northumbrian countryside and the, and the Northumbrians, they're lovely people. Uh, but it's a long time ago now. But I wanted to work and in, increase my practical experience working on a farm. And I got a job there. And I had a, one room in Brighton, which was a bath one floor up and a loo one floor down, a uh, little tiny room, uh, very expensive, got up at four, had breakfast, made my, made my little lunch, which used to be wrapped in, not in plastic, but in, in a nice cellophane, greaseproof paper, um, queuing up to the various facilities uh, so that I would catch two buses and get to Northeast at seven o'clock. Um, and I loved the idea. And after about 10 days, I was told to come and uh, go and to breaky bottom and find some sheep in the vacated garden. Nobody has lived here for 50 years, I tell you. And it was a most beautiful experience. From the top of the hill, I just took my breath away. Uh, and I asked him if I could move in. And he, after four or five days considering, uh, said, OK. Uh, there was no electricity, a standpipe outside for water. And it was just a wonderful place for somebody who loves to be sometimes in solitude, but in the country, love bird watching, love music, um, love reading poetry and prose, uh, and love growing things. Uh, so I've now been here for something like 53 years. Um, and I've loved every minute of it. Uh, I grow grapes. Why do I grow grapes? Um, I was about 14, probably, before I really realised we all had four grandparents. Mine were French, English, Irish, Italian. A, a real mix, a European mix. My dear maman had a French father, my grandpère, who lived to be good old age. Sadly, her Italian mum died when maman was still very young, so I know speak Italian. It's a, it's a great loss to me, really, but I do wave my hands around when I'm with Italians, you know. Okay, mais je parle français comme un vrai français. So, um, my grandpère had a restaurant in Soho before the First World War, Le Petit Savoyard in Greek Street. So he loved wine and loved great food, and he was a great guy. So I've learned an awful lot about wines as a kid in France when I was very young, when children were allowed to drink. In fact, if a child was, you know, a year, a year old, crying in a cradle after eight o'clock in the evening, people of eight years old, like me, like I was, were told to get a little spoonful of douze degrés so that they go to sleep, you know. <laughs> I learned a lot about wine from my grandpère. You must cue me, Matthew, if you want me to, to have, talk about other things. Um, he came from Normandy, from no Normandy, and there's no, there ain't no grapes in Normandy, okay, but he loved wine. So unlike most, you know, in 1880, whatever, whenever the time, most French folk, if they come from Bourgogne, what do Bourgogne come in? Or Medoc, oui, mon Bourgogne. If you come from Alsace, you drink Alsace. Huh? Uh, it, it, but for him, he loved wines. He had wines from all over France and gave them equal credit, equal attention. And I remember a long time when he was much older and he went to retire in the Midi in the south, southeast of France, near Antibes. 
sitting in his garden, uh, showing us firstly how to fill a pipe properly, if there's a new briar, to smoke it right through so that it'll live forever then. But also, he got a bottle, and I still remember absolutely, a bottle from his little cellar of Maurice Saint Denis, and he taught us three or four kids, we were in our early teens, to actually look at the label, appreciate what the, what the guy or the gal says this is, and it's quite pretty good wine. So you look at it, look at the year and everything, and uh, once you've done that appraisal, you've understood that this is not on the top of the hills, it's not in the bottom, it's too cold at the top, a bit too warm in the bottom, just that little strip of land which catches the sun in, uh, in, uh, from the southeast in the morning um, as the sun rises. Now we taste the wine and before we started he filled our glasses gently and he said don't forget, en français he said this, don't forget it's only fermented grape juice. So in other words he's saying give some respect to what they say it is, but then you are the judge. Just look at that wine. And it might be, you know, four pound a bottle or it might be 40 pound a bottle, but what the label says, but you taste it. So I've always liked that idea. I could stop talking now, or you could cue me, Matthew, as to something other delight that I could talk about. No, absolutely amazing so far. I, I, I could listen to you for, for hours, Peter. Don't I know, I know. Um, perhaps, perhaps you could go into a bit of detail about how you started at Breaky Bottom yeah. and the, yeah. kind of the, the journey that it's taken up until now in terms of okay. actual making. Okay. I'm happy to do that. Initially, of course, I worked on the main farm. I lived at Breaky Bottom. I lit candles in the evening because there's no electricity. And I turned up in the farm in the morning. Um, I eventually, uh, after three years, I was going to be here every year. But my family was saying, come on, you ought to leave. And you ought to move on, Peter, graduate into some higher station. And I was very reluctant because I loved this place and I did the garden, all the flowers and vegetables and I loved this place and I still do. Um, and so as I was leaving, I actually met the farmer's daughter and uh, funnily enough, after a short while, it led to us marrying. And my then uh, father-in-law said to me, very gruff gentleman he was, but a good farmer. And he said, well, you haven't got any money, Peter. And, um, and you want to farm, um, and you're the only one who likes Breaky Bottom. So how about me giving you a tenancy? And we agreed. And the tenancy is only about 30 acres in total, which is mostly steep hillside, to make this wonderful bowl, this wonderful valley. And that's how I planted, well, that's how I came to work here. And then I spent at least two years buying pigs, sows, to for piglets and uh, Christmas turkeys and chickens for selling eggs and uh, a sheep, which I've still got, actually. Just a wonderful mixed farm because I am in my head a little old fashioned about how I want to spend my life. Oh, that's a nice picture being shown there. There's a lovely sheep, yeah. And, and there's Colonel in Chief, yeah. <laughs> so, um, I am a bit old fashioned and I'm, I don't swank about it, I'm not proud about it. I'm just so delighted that, and I, I meet fellow girls and boys like me who feel the same way, who don't look for a huge, in this case, a huge vineyard or a huge pig farm. Or, yeah, I like just the mixed farm in the old days. I was born in Gloucestershire, actually. My mum was, we were in England, um, in my granny, my Irish granny's farmhouse in Gloucestershire while the bombs were still dropping in 43. And as we grow a little bit older and, and the bombs stopped dropping, and I, I thought, wonderful, I want to be a farmer. But we lived in London, so this didn't crop up for another 20 years, 30 years. So it's just a lovely place to be. Um, I went with my garden, uh, I went to Lewis to Elfix, the old gardening shop, to talk with John, who was at the, we used to have a nice smoke and about, and buy some plants and buy some seeds for the new year. Um, and one day he said, have you, he had a gardening magazine monthly or whatever, flipped the back page and said, look, wine some your vines. 
you know, grow, grow grapes and, and grow and make wine from your vines. And I, and it was the man whose name escapes me for the moment, but I contacted him. He was on the Isle of Wight, um, a little vineyard, Yarmouth, and he came over and we had a chat and he said, this would be a great place to plant vines. So that was a trigger. The idea that I get, now in those days there were, I'm gonna guess about half a dozen of us. We were risk takers um, because there was no track record. Um, I'm not saying how clever, I'm just saying how risky we are. And I, I still am, I'm, um, I love smoking and I'm not smoking now because I'm talking to you and I could fill the whole room with smoke, I'd disappear. But we risk takers on the wine front were optimist and made still wine in those days. We've grown from about six vineyards, so brace yourselves, there are over 800 vineyards in the UK now. Uh, and one could say all sorts of highlights about how wonderful it is. Firstly, there's some bloody good wine being made by lots of people and acknowledge that. Um, my dear friend, Oz Clark, you know, this is Oz's new book, yeah? Um, I'm not, oh, away you go there, man. <laughs> yeah, but it's a great book. Because dear Oz, and I've known him for 40 plus years, I think this was the first vineyard that Oz visited, you know? Um, what happened was that, um, yes, because Oz was a great singer and actor um, in his youth, but at college, university, he'd also enjoyed the wine club. And there came a time when he was still very young when he th he's got to make the decision. Am I gonna jump horse and do something else? And wine won. And uh, he's become a hugely respected, he's got a palate equal to none. Um, it's terrific. And he talks, of course, I don't talk. <laughs> um, but he came down here, I think it was the first vineyard, and he spent nine hours here. Thank gosh, God, he had a chauffeur to take him back home, back to London. Um, we were here nine hours and we drank an awful lot. <laughs> Um, and we just got to know each other. And wasn't that a nice thing about not only did we both love wine, but we did love other things in the world. He loved the garden that was here, and he and he loves music and the arts and acting and everything, you know. So it's, it's wonderful. You meet somebody, wine is the thing in common initially, then you find, oh, you also like, you know, whatever, ballooning. Yeah, I don't like ballooning. I never tried it. Yeah, uh, but Ozzy's book that we've just flashed on the screen is actually uh, um, Ozzy's all blowing a trumpet. He's saying we have gotten there. That's what he's saying. It, it's it's it does touch a light on still wines, but it is about sparkling wine. And he's just saying to the reader, consider the small areas where there's this cool climate making good fizz across the world, you know, including Champagne, of course. Um, we have gotten there. You know, if, 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 you, if you taste the, the good wines from the UK, you will find that you should be delighted. You will, I mean, I, I, my contemporaries, you know, there are lots and lots of them, I'm a hermit, I don't go, I, I work what I really call eight days a week. But let's say I, I work seven days a week and there's always things to do. If you're owner driver, Christina and I together, it, it, it's a job. And we have two local friends who come and do part-time work because they love wine too. Um, so there you go. It's, um, I, I'm lost now because I'm, I, I lose, I lose my way. Oh, who did that? They can all see that. Beware the bull. Yeah, with a fag in his gob. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> brilliant. I've got the same clothes on. I haven't got my hat on, but otherwise, <laughs> you know. Ah, uh, yeah. Perhaps, Peter, you could tell us yeah. about the grape varieties that you grow, because you're... Yeah different to many in that you champion Sauvage Blanc as well as the traditional Champagne grapes. Could you, could you say some. a little bit about that, please? Sure. Yeah. Um, when I planted initially, just, just to wine, nobody was thinking of sparkling. 
Um, there were very few uh, grape varieties around, available, mostly from Germany. Uh, the Germans could come, could speak good English. They were very courteous. They sold good vines and they gave good advice. Um, for some for some reason, um, I had a French couple of French people who came and they didn't speak any English at all, um, which suited me, of course. But also they they sold me some bad vines and they you know they, the French weren't going to jump on board and say oh let's help the English to do it. But the Germans were very good. So the classic one was um, Wollaturgo I grew. Okay, uh, noble parentage, Riesling Silvana Cross, and um, and actually, I'm not trying to promote Breaky Bottom, actually, but it's mm -hmm. worth mentioning that Ozzy's little book there applauds the quality of the Mulatoga that I made. Because, so, you know, it's not the Papa Rhine, you know, the, yeah, uh, it, which is grown on potato fields and put, you know, 30 tons to the acre. This is just sort of modest two and a half, three tons to the acre. And it showed the parents, parents show. There was a, a man who's probably 110 now, okay? So he's probably in heaven. A German, a businessman, very, very nice, very smart, with a little silver trim briefcase. Every year he would come here, he would taste the current Mulatoga that's had two years in the bottle or whatever, and he would buy four cases, 48 bottles. Boom. Um, the last time I saw him, and he was really pretty old, and I remember showing him the new, but properly aged Wollotogo that he hadn't tasted, and he drank it, and he, you know, he, he really, he, he really, not with this glass. When he, he just said very slowly, Peter, this is the best Wollotogo I've ever tasted. You know, and I can't even remember his name, dear man, it's a long time ago. So I planted Molotoga, and I'm very pleased to have done. And I planted Seval Blanc from Good Grower. And I love both grapes, and they're totally different. You know, the, 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 all the great spread of flavors from the Molotoga. And the Seval is a very clean, straight down the middle taste. Um, quite different, fresh, like the Loire. It's very, just a fresh, refreshing taste. And I've really used that. I know when I had still wines, and the still Seval, I always imagined it would be good with bubbles, because you could it's just a, because it's not being invaded with other. What, what I can't remember what you call them now. It doesn't matter. Um, so I'm happy to have both. Um, yeah, I. Uh, come on, Charles Metcalf, International Wine Challenge. Yeah, yeah. Another, another dear friend from way back, and still is. And uh, he he had, uh, he rung me up once and said, oh, you, your Seval has just won, I think it was the first gold medal, still wine, for England. And I remember answering him back saying, um, what do you mean, hasn't won the best white wine in the world? <laughs> I knew him well, just joking, of course, but I was thrilled, you know. And anyway, Mother Turga would never have made good fizz, but there was a time, and I'm trying to guess, I'm going to guess about 19, um, 1994, um, I decided to make fizz. To, and, yeah, so the, the yeah, 1994. Just to put that into context, I, th you, I think you won the... The Muller Turgau won the award in 1993, didn't it, or something like that? Ah, 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 no, 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 there's a Seval Blanc. 19, it was the 1990 ah. Seval Blanc, which won the International Wine Challenge Gold in 1993. Ah, there you go. That was it. Yeah. That's it. That's it. Amazing. Yeah. Um, yeah. So then the, the, the big surge of. Uh, Let's plant a vineyard, wow. You know, I love the idea of a couple saying, you know, who, who work in the city, okay, lucrative occupation, who say to each other, do you know, if we live for 300 years, we would have enough money if we were retired today <laughs> with our pensions and this and the other, you know. 
lovely. So I can see why it's a seductive idea. And of course, all the time that really good fizz is being made, the newcomer thinks, you know, look, taste this, darling. Whoa, look at that. Whoa, why don't we? So that's, you know, Tattinger and others uh, already planted some years ago, no, two, three years ago, you know. And they're not, they won't be the last. Watch this space, you know, it's going to go on. Um, and it was appropriate after 25 or more years of the Muda Togo, I think in France every 25 years, commercial vineyards would perhaps, you know, replant a fifth of the vineyard, sixth of the vineyard. Yeah. And um, so they were pulled up with some regret. And I then planted Chardonnay, Pinot Noir, Pinot Meunier. It was mostly um, Chardonnay. That for me, that would be the major grape, and I, and I don't regret having done that. But Pinot Noir and Pinot Meunier, very nice too. In, in fact, you know, the bigger vineyards, many dear friends of mine, they, they can actually make uh, um, Blanc de Blanc with, this, the, with the Chardonnay, and they can make a Blanc de Noir with their Pinots, uh, or, and then a blend of the two, which is you know, champagne style, if you like. But, uh, and in 2018, which was a bloody good summer, uh, and my very modest, less than six acre vineyard, I did get enough of, of the red grapes, the Pinots, to make a Blanc de Noir. And, you know, because I, it won't be released for some time, um, you know, I, I could move on to saying how well the Champagne varieties have, have done too in their own right. You know, that Reynolds Stone from 2010, you know, is a delicious wine. It was a wonderful summer. And it was matched by the Seval from that year, the Koizumi Yakumo. I, I name all these vintages after previous, after people that I have known, family, close friends. Um, that's why there's a Reynolds Stone one, because Reynolds Stone great, great designer and wood engraver and letter cutter. Um, I got to know him uh, because I was looking for top class engraving for my first labels and wonderful, you know. Both those wines the, the, from the 2010s are now actually rather expensive because my, my contemporaries who do care for me, they've sort of said, well, you know, you really ought to consider people. You know, I, you know, I don't need to have a wine at a hundred pound a bottle. But they were very modestly priced for their quality. You know, for ten years on late aging on the lees before disgorgement and all that. Yeah, so they have gone up a bit. Um, what else would you like to? Because I get distracted. You see, when no, you get we, my age, you get distracted. That's absolutely fine. Should we? Should we perhaps talk about the 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 wine that that we're currently selling at the moment, the yeah, Juve Jack Pike, yeah. Perhaps, perhaps you, you mentioned that each wine is named after someone you've known. Yeah. Perhaps you could start by saying who Jack Pike was. Yes, yes. When we moved from London, en famille, when I was nineteen, I think it was like nineteen sixty-one. I'm guessing, um, to a lovely place, just. Uh, Fen Place Mill, Turner's Hill, near East Grinstead. Uh, we needed some help because there was a, a, a modest estate and we needed a lawn mowing and this and that and that. And Jack Pike lived in the village and became an absolute friend of the families, both he and his wife, Maisie. And all the time we lived there, before I went to Breaky Bottom, Mm -hmm. uh, I worked with him. He was a very dear man he, and a very hard worker. He was slight of build and worked like heck. And he taught me, it's his fault actually, <laughs> he taught me how that one can, out of choice, apply oneself and work physically hard. And I loved him for that. And he was such good company. Mm -hmm. We drank like fishes and smoked like chimneys. <clears throat> and sadly, it's, I'm going to guess it's only four years ago, so he died. It's a considerable age. And of course, I was invited to speak at his funeral. He was very close to me. Um, that's Jack Pike. I counted the first one. 
Yeah, he planted the first vines with me. Chris has just reminded me. And uh, we, you know, we had these bundles of vines and it was the first off for both of us. And we dug the first hole and we planted the first vine and he sort of mopped his brow and, you know, empty, open space of plowed soil. What do we do now? I said, what we do now, we unzip ourselves and pee into the hole we've just planted. <laughs> And I pretended that it was a French tradition, you know. <laughs> so, so we did that. And then we planted the whole bloody lot. But with his inspiration to learn how to work, to work in a way that many, many, many people still do, I allow. But in the old days, when there was no alternative, there weren't many machines, you physically did things, yeah. you know. Yeah. So so th this is this is your most recent release, isn't it? Despite being 2015, this is this is your most recent release that you only released about six months ago, am I right? Correct. Um, yeah, 15, so bottled in 16, 17, 18, 19, 20. It's had pretty much four years on the lease. Mm -hmm. Each vintage is different. I come from the same vineyard, but they express themselves differently. And sometimes a vintage shows earlier than others, I'd say. But some of my older vintage I got now, they've been, you know, for eight or 10 years, 11 years on the lees. Um, I've got an equivalent uh, at the same year, 2015, which is the Cuvée David Pearson. Now that, again, is, is sort of more contemporary because dear David was the first man to sell me cardboard boxes <laughs> when I had my first till wine. It's true. We need these things. He was a sales rep, came down, uh, and very individual, special guy. Uh, won't go into his history, but a sort of one-off guy, been to Africa and things that weren't really, you know, he'd studied agriculture. And uh, he was known, because I know quite a lot of Davids, lovely name, uh, he was known as David Cardboard Boxman. <laughs> okay? And in fact, he was known as CBBM. David Cardboard Box then, CBBM. <laughs> uh, and I, when I was doing, actually doing the label, telling the printer to do the label, I hovered a bit and I can't say Cuvée CBBM, it wouldn't be right. Mm -hmm. So I gave him his proper name. And he died three years ago, actually two years ago, two years ago. So I salute him too, see on the label. But otherwise I got, you know, my parents and my compere, they, they've had, Cuvées, um, yeah. uh, the, the, the crazy one, not crazy, but the unusual one, if you like, um, my 2010 Seval Blanc is Koizumi Yakumo. And for those who are listening in and watching, um, if you know of, yeah. Okay. Yeah, sorry, I'm sorry I'm delayed. Because, uh, yeah, um, Hearn. Lafcadio. Lafcadio Hearn. I'm so, please forgive. As you get older, your memory gets tum tum tum. I'm still with you. <laughs> Lafcadio Hearn was a great writer, and anybody can Google him, and you, you perhaps shouldn't shop from Amazon, but if you click Amazon and put his name up there, Lafcadio Hearn, you'll find there's 50 books of his still. So he was my great great uncle. And he ended up, he's a great travel writer of the top, top draw. He ended up by being sent by Harper's to go to Japan. Born in 1850, 1890, sent to Japan at the age of 40. Never left the shores, fell in love with everything Japanese beyond the girls and, and the wonderful culture. And Japan was completely sealed off in those days from the rest of the world. And when his work was translated back into Japanese, they worshipped him. When he was a professor at Tokyo University, and now if I have Japanese people come down here, and I learned from young Japanese people to say his Japanese name, Koizumi Yakumo, they learn about him in the schools, from prep school, kindergarten onwards. Wow. Yeah, it is a real wow. And I've just got a huge order actually for some now very expensive in Japan. Yeah, yeah, because they like the wine too. I hope you know. Well, English sparkling wine is is doing incredibly well in Japan at the moment. A lot yeah, of 
a lot of people I buy from are saying that the Japanese market is one of their largest at the moment. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. Well, that's great. In terms of the, um, so go back to the Jack Pike, I think yes. for, perhaps for people that haven't tried it before or tried sparkling wine from Seval Blanc, perhaps you could say a little bit about how it differs from wines made from the classic champagne varieties um, in terms of its its flavour and perhaps how it how you make it, whether the vinifica vinification is any different in comparison. Yeah, I always find it difficult to describe these things. Um, I'm glad I'm not a wine writer. <laughs> um, I, I will answer your question. They're, they're so wonderfully distinctly different. The champagne varieties, uh, on any blend even, you know, um, Chardonnay and Pinots, uh, they've got a fullness and a sort of a depth, um, which some of our wines in the UK, you know, they achieved. Sure, they do, absolutely. Um, I think Seval for me is a sort of magic, it's a mystery really. Um, the, what I know is, and Oz confirms this, there's a, quite a lot of growers who don't care, the UK growers who don't care for Seval because it's, it's, it's not a noble variety. It's a hy hybrid, a transatlantic cross. Um, and it was bred for the Loire way back, 100 years ago nearly, to make, you know, make more, when, when the only wine you could buy in a restaurant from Helsinki to John O'Groves, if you ask for the wine list, would be France. Yeah, you know, there it is. It, it's all changed now, thank goodness, but it was, that even in my youth, it was like that. France, 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 France. Yeah, for all the different wines. Um, what's your question? Yeah, Seval. Um, <laughs> Oz admits that Seval from Breaky Bottom has got some magic. And years ago, he said to me, what's the secret of your, you know, and I just said to him, well, he actually, he wrote a whole thing, article about it, and he said, uh, he asked me this, uh, here I'm at the foot of the man who makes the water his wine in England, blah, 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 blah. and I uh, hope you didn't hear that. And he re resolutely refuses to behave properly. In other words, I said, there isn't a secret. You think I'm a messy and I'm going to tell you how I make this? There isn't. There isn't. It's wonderful. A piece of terroir, just a piece, and whether or not the good Lord exists, and I'm not going to debate that for the moment, you know, but there's some, I like to think it's some heavenly floating thing. My guardian angel does it for me because I do minimal interfere, minimal interference when I'm making the wine. I pick late. I, I pick a fortnight. When my daughters used to walk away with me, I still do, but walk in, fit in the autumn when it's ready for pick. They're eating grapes on a weekend and they're saying, Dad, you should pick this weekend. Quick. So I said, thank you, darlings, because that means I'm a fortnight away from picking. <laughs> and I, so I do, I'm one of the latest to start picking. It's easy for me because I've only got six acres. If you've got, you know, 200 acres and people coming in from Europe to pick for you or, or whatever, and you're paying them, you know, it's quite different. So I like to pick late uh, and I risk, take the risk that you, the weather could turn against you. You could get more botrytis mold, which has to be excluded from any well-made uh, champagne method. Um, uh, pick late, uh, a minimal interference. I don't do any malolactic fermentation. Um, I would rather, because after all, as grapes ripen, the total acidity does go down. We know mm -hmm. that but also conveniently, the rather harsh Apelli Malik uh, decreases against the amount of tartaric acid, mm -hmm. which is a more palatable one. So there's this nice balance. And if you do pick late like Peter Hall does at Breaky Bottom, you probably don't need a mallet. You know, you probably don't need to try and get rid of that. Uh, furthermore, with bottle aging, and I don't like to release wines, you know, after two years in, you know, on the lees, I'd like to wait, wait, be patient. So if you if you wait anyway, that any harshness is suppressed. Mm -hmm. It's wonderful. Yeah. I mean, the wines that, that are well made, Breaky Bottom and many other UK vineyards, really well made and cellared well, they will go on improving. Somebody can have look, you know, like you know, I will say, Cuvée Jack Pike. Let's talk about it in two years' time. If there's any left, it'll get better. Absolutely, yeah. definitely. 
I mean, it'll live for 15 years, I'm sure, from now. Yeah, definitely. I mean, when I when I was lucky enough to taste through basically your whole range of the kind of midway through last year, yeah. this I, I I loved the Jack Pike because I, I think your champagne varietal wines are absolutely delicious and they show what those great varieties can do really well. Mm. But that for some reason, this just there was such a lovely clarity to it and a really nice. Yeah. Englishness, I want to say about it. There's lovely, kind of white flowers and lovely citrus, and there's uh, an acidity yeah. to it, which is almost I found this a bit like popping candy in the back of your throat. It kind of really okay. tickles, and so okay. it, it just made me made me smile. And so hopefully the people that 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 buy it and try it kind of agree that there's a lovely freshness. And I'd be very interested, again, like you say, to see how it ages, because I'll mm. hold my hand up and say I've been incredibly mean with the drink date on the Wine Society website of saying now to 2025, which, to be honest, you know, yeah, well, it, it, could, it could do another 15 years on top yeah, of that. As long as it's selling properly. As long as yeah, it's selling properly, of course. Yeah. Um, and I, I could remind you, Matthew, I think your email to me when, when you were saying I tasted the wines at last, found the time, and I loved them. Um, and I found the Cuvée Jack Pike, I think you said, utterly charming. <laughs> you said, yeah, you see? Yeah. I, 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 and I, I, t I totally agree with that tasting note still. I, I really find it a yeah. charming wine. And I've, I've, I've said it before on Zooms I've done with other English producers that I struggle with English sparkling wine that just tastes of autolysis and of oak fermentation and stuff like that i want to taste the grapes yes and in this you taste the grapes and yeah. you know, although it's you know it's been aged on the lees for four or five years it's still yeah. super fresh and oh, yeah. super, oh, yeah. it's, a, it's a wine and so many others i taste aren't wines where this is um, yeah and i think we've got some questions from members so if, if you don't yes. mind we're going to open it up to the to the room to ask some questions of you if please, that's do. All right. please do please do Catherine, Anna. Hello. Thank you. Um, Peter, that was fascinating to be listening to. I've just been sat here beaming at your, your stories and watching the, um, the images go past. And we have had some lovely questions and a lot of really lovely comments from people as well in the chat that have, um, that have visited you, that have, we've had one lady today that actually um, waved at you while you were out with the sheep. You shared a wave earlier this afternoon. So you've got a lot of fans. Oh, that's right. We were out with the sheep and there were two people, I did wave and they waved back, yeah. Yeah, so they are here. So the first oh, we have is from Tony and Tony I think we've unmuted you now so hopefully you'll be able to ask your question yourself. Yes thank you. Um, hello Peter glad to see you looking well. Hello Tony. We've known one another for a while. Yes we have. Um, I wondered how you dealt with um, social distance picking at the end of last year. Oh gosh. And I also have a question um, I can't bring myself to drink my last two bottles, I've got a 1999 uh, René Alexander and a uh, 2006 English Hall. I can't bring myself to open them. Am I too late now? That, that's my question. Uh, I, I have not tasted those for really some time. I've probably got three or four bottles of each. Um, Tony, if they were sellered well, um, well, it's obviously worth a try in any way. Respect for the wine and the winemaker. And if it ain't no good, well, you'll know. But if it's halfway there, I think that well made wines, good quality wines, don't fall off the edge of a cliff like, a, you know, four pound a bottle of wine, uh, you know, after 18 months. They don't. They, 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 they become, they decline gracefully and they show. And actually, a lot of, like, I like Burgundy when it is just over the top and still, still waving like a beautiful lady of age. It's really lovely. And other people don't like it. They like it to be a bit zippy. So, uh, Tony, you should try try them. Uh, and I'd love to hear how you get on, sir. <laughs> yeah. See what happens. And on the on the distancing, the... the oh, yes. Sorry, Tony. Yeah, no, okay. no, was that something you. that Thanks was for, a you know, hindrance? Or? Well, there, there was obviously concern, and, and I hope that all citizens are responsible and we we got some bad troubles before um, but we were going to pick 
We had a frost this year for the first time ever. First time in 45 years. We're so near the sea, we don't get frost, but there was a very particular frost in the middle of May, uh, an eviction frost from the Arctic, and it hit us and other vineyards too. So we lost 80% of our fruit this year. And the option was to abandon it altogether because of COVID and that. But a party of lovely, dedicated friends, followers, oh, please come, come out. And so we did pick, and I did insist on the distancing, but I have to admit that over the two days we picked this modest crop, it wasn't easy. I can't, if I'm in the winery pressing grapes and things, I can't be policing all the time. And uh, I've not heard that anybody has suffered from, from, from each other, so to speak. But it's a problem, sure. Mm -hmm. And you'll go on being a problem. Absolutely. So we've had a, a question um, that was emailed in to us a bit earlier on today from um, Steve Halls. So I'm just going to, I've written it down so I can write okay. justice. Um, but he's actually said that he has a limited knowledge of English wines, um, but he's noticed that the recommended drinking dates, so going back to what we were just talking about in terms of ageing, he's noticed that they do tend to be shorter in comparison to other wines from around the world that are perhaps the same variety or a similar style. Is that something that's true? And if it is, why is that? Why would it be that perhaps English wines aren't able to be um, sort of left as long as other wines? Or is it just that perhaps because they're newer, um, people are just a little bit more restrained in doing so. Mm -hmm. And as you've said, they can be left for time and will develop? Yeah, well, it's a, it's a funny question. I mean, well, well, let's just say all my friends and many I haven't met before who planted over 800 vineyards in total, um, there, there, there is sometimes an air of impatience. I mean, if you've invested three million pounds in a large plot of land and the planting and the first, uh, two years of establishment and maybe a little crop in the third year, and then you've got to wait how many years on the lease for your first fish? So some, sometimes people are rather in, impatient. And, um, and I taste that if I do get to taste other English wines, very good winemakers, and I'm thinking, gosh, it's a little early, isn't it? So that, you know, but they, I, I don't know otherwise how to answer the question. I mean, it's the, Perhaps I'll jump because he's, he's possibly referring to some of the drink dates that we put on the Wine Society oh, as well. And yeah. Oh, I fine. Possibly. Sorry. I, 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 I want people to buy them and I want them to, people to drink them because they're very good. And then we can yeah. buy more and they can drink more. Um, but right. I think um, Peter's wines are well known for, for aging incredibly well. And yeah, I said already that I was quite mean with his drink date, mainly because it, the wine was going in a mixed case with two other wines and they all had similar drink dates and I didn't want to put a ridiculously long one on it because <laughs> it makes the case a bit silly. Um, but I think for, 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 for some wines, like the, the non-vintage ones, Peter does vintage wines. And so with, with the non-vintage ones, usually they've got quite a lot of reserve wine in. Sometimes they're a little bit richer and a little bit more forward and really are probably best within kind of two three years but the, the vintage wines from really good years like the 2015 jack pike will 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 go for for time and and they will get better and they will improve and you know i'll be fascinated to see what this is like in five ten years time because i've not tried a, a kind of an aged Saval blanc yeah. before so, so i yeah. think part of it's possibly knowledge as well um there's a lot of new English sparkling wine producers and they you simply can't give long drink dates because you haven't tried their wines after 10 years under court. Sure. So, you know, that's my view anyway. Yeah. yeah, can, can I, can, am I able to just say something on that or not? Absolutely, please. Well, please only, please only that you're right, you've reminded me, uh, there are many more vineyards, especially the bigger ones, doing N NV wines. Uh, and with that, there's another way of, of, if you like, of setting the wine up mm -hmm. for a, an earlier market. Yeah, yeah, good. Wonderful. 
So the next question we have is from um, Mark Havers. And I think, Mark, we're just unmuting you. So if you are now able, please do go ahead and ask your question. OK, hi, Peter. Thanks for that really interesting talk. Okay. Um, live in Brighton and we're doing a lot of our kind of uh, lockdown exercise um, in your kind of area at the moment. And uh, having spent uh, the week knee deep in mud, we're wondering how you're coping with uh, and how you're responding to the terrible wet weather at the moment. Yeah, well, you should ask my sheep that because they, <laughs> yeah, um, the vines don't mind. I, I know that some vineyards may have problems because vines hate having their roots wet in the winter. And, and that is an absolute given. But the privilege of growing on chalk, very much like champagne chalk, is that there's a free draining constantly, constantly. So the vines will not suffer in the winter like that. Only the people who were, we were doing some pruning today earlier. Um, and it just a little muddy and, and, and it was rather gloomy and things, but we cope and even the sheep cope, but I don't think they like all these sort of sticky, you know, the gateways and things. I just brought them in because they're due to lamb earlier than they should have done. Yeah, I don't mind. I, the joy of living in the UK, uh, in poking out a bit into the Atlantic, the Atlantic weather, who would enjoy a wonderful, beautiful day with the sun rising, uh, absolutely crystal clear, if they didn't have something to compare it with? You know, if you didn't have the wet weather, sometimes for 10 blooming days, it, the contrasts are lovely. No, I, that's what I say. I love Breaky Bottom, even when it's raining. <laughs> Mark, I hope that's okay. Absolutely. So let me just get the next questions we have coming through. We've had a lot this evening. Okay. So we've had a, a question from um, Alan Pierce. And we might see if we'll be able to unmute Alan. If not, I will ask the question on his yeah. behalf. Let's just give, here we go. So Alan, I think we're unmuting you. If you're happy to ask, would you please do? Yes, um, I'd like to know um, really about um, English red wines. Do you think they will ever be able to achieve reasonable standard? Um, you've got English wines have had a fantastic um, reputation for sparkling wines lately, but my experience of UK red wines is not so good. Um, what do you think? Well, Alan, um, I've, I ain't never made no red wine in England. I, know, I accept your question completely, and I could, I could use my Pinot you know, uh, and make still wine with it, certainly. Um, gosh, I've been in this game for nearly half a century. Um, Nobody thought of trying to make red wines in the early times, early still wine days. Um, no names, no pack drill, as they say. So I'm going to tell you something. <laughs> uh, a very dear friend of mine, uh, a grower on a pretty big vineyard and a very good winemaker, years ago, uh, she said, um, I'm going to um, really major on red wine. And I said to her, why is that? She said, well, there's such a demand for red wine. You know, speaking to a Frenchman, I, it, yes, I understand. My favorite would be red wine, actually, from Burgundy, but that's, that. okay. I said, look, there's a great demand for pineapples. Why don't you whack in a couple of acres of those as well? Just <laughs> as a joke, because it was so inappropriate. Um, and for many people, it still remains inappropriate. But I declare I've not tasted, I haven't been around. I'm the hermit who works seven days a week. I haven't been around to taste. And I know reading, uh, reading really good articles from people who do care for wine, spokespeople, saying this is something to behold. You know, and so, uh, and this will go on developing. If you like, uh, global warming is helping. Uh, so that, you know, this is, but. I don't want to go there because I've got very particular views about that. Uh, but um, the climate is different. Um, Andrew Jefford, great wine writer and very dear friend, now lives in the longer dock, but still writes a lot. Uh, years ago, when I started, it was still wine days, just coming into sparkling wine days. So we're talking about 
um, 1970s and 1980s. And I said to Andrew, the 90s and into just 2000, it, it's getting better. That, but the, the 70s and 80s were what I call B-A-W. So he looked at me and I said, bloody awful weather. <laughs> okay, so this is how the weather, climate, the climate changes. But if you look back over history, the climate has changed hugely, sometimes quite rapidly, sometimes more slowly. And I have no doubt that human beings are contributing to let's save the world, you know, so we're working on that. But uh, it, it, have I waffled on too long? No, no, I don't, no. I, I can't belittle red wine of, that I haven't tasted. And, I, and maybe Matthew may well have tasted many more than I have. And yeah. he have his own opinion. <coughs> but I know they are getting better. Yeah. And, and therefore <coughs> watch this space. That's what yeah. I say. I, I definitely agree with that. And I think we're, we're lucky. I think you mentioned already that 2018 was a very, very good year. It was a warm sure. summer. We all remember it being very warm. Um, I think it was the Football World Cup, wasn't it? Everyone was out enjoying the football in the sun and yada, yada, yada. And there are some very good English red wines from 2018 in particular. And I have bought one and we'll be releasing it later this year. And I have more samples and I will probably buy more. Um, because yeah. you know, there is promising. The problem is, is that they are expensive for what they are. You're looking at 30 quid for an English Pinot Noir. And when yeah. you look even to Burgundy, you can get some good stuff for 30 quid in Burgundy. So that's the problem. But when you take it as what it is, was it, as what it is for English red wine, it's, it's very good. Um, cool. Yeah. Next question. Any more questions? We have one more question, just the one to be doing now. Um, and it's from Richard. Now, Richard, I think we have just unmuted you. Um, so if we have, please do go ahead. Thank you very much. Um, and Peter, thank you for your fascinating insights, as always. I was very fortunate enough to visit you about five or six years ago with a group yeah. of friends. You were very kind, you showed us around and, and we tasted and we bought. It was a lovely afternoon. Great. One of the things you told us you had was problems with pheasants. Oh. Um, and they were stealing all your grapes in the, in the summer and the autumn. And I just wondered whether you'd resolve that problem or are the pests still around? Gosh, Richard, I, I love Catherine saying, uh, this is the, you know, the last question. And, I, and I'm suddenly thinking, how long have you got? <laughs> I'll try it. Yeah. Um, gosh. In 2010, the local farm adjacent to Breaky Bottom started a very big farm, started a commercial pheasant shoot. And, and we, had, we had masses, masses of pheasants. This is open country above me, not pheasant country, they're like woods. Partridge were fine in the open country, but the pheasants came down on the very first day of release and they consumed tons and tons of grapes. I can't, and, I, and I have been to, to law to recover some losses, um, but you only get a tiny bit of what your actual loss is. To try and, it went on uh, the, for six years, so 2010 for the next six years, um, we lost, brace yourself, 30,000 bottles of Breaky Bottom sparkling wine. So, so, so th this is not trivial, I tell you. And this was, you can't get any, you can't get the lawyers to listen from the other side unless you pay a lot of money to have experts actually be on the ground and measure before they release the pheasants, estimate the crop in various parcels of land and then weigh them off when they come in, allow for some loss to um, wild birds or to botrytis mold, which shouldn't go into the sparkling wine. So it's a juggling match. But um, I was paid an undisclosed amount. Um, you know, I wouldn't gonna get anything as I accepted whatever non-disclosure. Well, I can tell you, I got one pound 92 pence per bottle. There you go. Did you uh, manage to get any pheasants for the table? They want to sue me for disclosing that, they can. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, no, it, it's it's a terrible thing, I, I, and I'm not, I'm not against shooting, but i It's just a commercial idea. People would helicopter in from the low countries, and, and pay a lot of money just for day shooting. 
you know, and probably not take the birds home, just they probably bury them. I don't know. It's, it's, it's not the right way to do things. Mm. There you go. Thank you for reminding me, Richard, isn't it? Yes. I've gotten over that one, actually, but there you go. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you so much, Peter, for giving us your evening today. I mean, that has been a fascinating hour. Um, I don't know about anyone else. I could I could listen to you talk for, for hours more. It's absolutely amazing. But thank you so much, and thank you, Matthew, as well for uh, joining and hosting. Yeah, no problem. Thank you, Peter. I've been looking forward to this for a, for a long time. So thank well, you. It's been an absolute well, pleasure to see you again. It's it's been great to meet your team and you, and the nice people who've listened in. And I wish them all who've joined in Zoom the very very best. Not only, you know, with the whole of life, but with the wonderful wines they're going to choose from the Wine Society. Yeah. Yeah. I'll have to put my order in too, so, <laughs> you know. No, it's been really nice. Thank you, thank you. You're thank welcome. You. And thank you, everybody, for joining us. Okay. Thanks, everybody. Good evening. Bye-bye. Bye, Peter. Cheers.